We're going to continue our understanding of kinetic energy, potential energy, and how they're related. Uh, some important things to remember is that this is the equation for kinetic energy. It's the energy of motion. Anything that's moving has kinetic energy. Also, we have the equation for gravitational potential energy. Potential energy is energy position. Gravitational potential energy is uh, related to the position the object is above some reference point, usually the ground or some other reference point. And we have a law of conservation of energy where the total energy that something starts with, both kinetic and potential, is equal to the final energy that an object has after an interaction or process takes place, both kinetic and potential uh, uh, energies. So we're going to uh, start doing some more example problems of how these energy relationships are um, used to solve problems. We did this real simple problem here where we have an object falling uh, a certain height. Remember, the gravitational potential energy is simply the height it is, the vertical height it is, from some reference point. And so whatever energy it starts with, in this case it has just potential energy, there's no kinetic energy to start with, all that potential energy is converted to kinetic energy as it falls. In this problem here, it has kinetic energy going up because it's thrown up, and where it's released from a person's hand when it's tossed up, that position we're defining as zero potential energy, and then the only energy it has to start with is kinetic energy, and all that kinetic energy is converted to potential energy at its highest point. We solve those problems. We're going to expand on that a little bit. We're going to use this analogy to solve um, some inclined plane problems. Let me get set up here. Papers. Uh, let's see what we have. Right, so let's do uh, example. You need some plain white paper or notebook paper, or you can do this in notability, but you need to draw some diagrams. And what we're going to do here are some problems involving the law of conservation of energy. And we're starting with an inclined plane. We've done some inclined plane problems previously. So this is going to be an inclined plane. So remember, we said that um, uh, some scientists think and some physicists think that you really don't start understanding physics, really good physics, until you start analyzing energy relationships. And if you understand energy relationships, it can make what might seem a very complex problem into something a lot easier to solve for. So let's take, for example, an inclined plane problem. Now, previously, before we used energy relationships, we used uh, forces and vector analysis and how to, how to analyze all that information. But let's see how we can use this in energy relationships, or using energy relationships to solve this problem. Let's say we have an object at the top of the ramp. The initial velocity of this object is zero, so it's at rest. We'll simplify it that way. The length of the incline from the top of the incline to the bottom, the entire length of the incline, we'll say is 1.30 meters. Okay. This incline, then an angle, and we'll say the vertical height of that incline, this is 0 0.40 meters above the ground. Okay. And we'll say that the mass of this object is a half a kilogram, 0 0.500 kilograms. Now, we're going to say for initially, we're going to say that this incline is frictionless. We're going to do it both with friction and without friction. And what we want to do is we want to determine what the final velocity of that object is at the bottom of the path. Now, in order for us to do, previously, in order to do, we had to do vector analysis and get the net force and the acceleration, all those types of things. But using energy relationships, we can make that even uh, easier than what it was before. Just by understanding that the total energy that you start with must be the same as the total energy that you end up with. So let's take a look at what we have to start. We have an object uh, at the top of an incline, and if we say that our zero potential energy level is the ground, or at the bottom of the incline, this is defined as our zero potential energy level. It is some vertical height above that zero potential energy level. So it has potential energy at the top of the incline. And so at the beginning of the path, this is the potential energy at the top. It's not moving, so it doesn't have any kinetic energy. Again, remember, it's the initial kinetic energy plus the initial potential energy equals the final kinetic energy plus the final potential energy. This is what we're using to solve that problem. Well, we don't have any kinetic energy, so all we need is the initial potential energy. I'm putting this potential energy at the top, which is the same thing as initial potential energy, because that's what it's starting with. All right, so it slides down the incline. There's no friction. 
All right, so there's no work done by the move by the friction force down the incline, but we'll include that in the problem here just a little bit. At the bottom of the path, when it reaches the bottom of the path, it's at the bottom of the incline. At the bottom of the incline, it has no potential energy. So the final potential energy of the bottom of the path is going to be zero. So it is moving, so the only energy it has at the bottom of the path is kinetic energy. So potential energy at the top is going to be equal to the kinetic energy at the bottom of the path. That's how we solve the problem. The equation for potential energy is mgh. This is the height at the top is equal to the kinetic energy, one-half mv, this is the velocity at the bottom, squared. Don't forget to square that. Now, we can either keep the mass in or we can cancel out. It doesn't matter because both of these objects have uh, mass in them. I'm going to go ahead and cancel out this time. You don't have to. You can put it in. It's going to end up canceling out anyway. So g, again, these are magnitudes only. We've already gone through the derivation with positive and negative signs. So these are magnitudes only. Energy is not a vector. Energy is a magnitude, a scalar quantity. So this is going to be 9.80 meters per second squared, not negative, times the height, the vertical height that is from the zero potential energy level. This vertical height is 0 0.40 meters equals one half times the velocity at the bottom squared. You should do this calculation to verify that this is correct. This final velocity at the bottom then is going to be 2.80 meters per second. You just put 2.8 if you're using correct significant digits. 2.80 meters per second. This is if it's frictionless. Now let's take a look if there is friction. Remember, all the energy at the top of the path must equal all the energy from the top to the bottom. Now, what's happened when there's friction is there is a friction force in the opposite direction of motion. Remember, a force times distance is work. Work is energy. What's actually happening here is some of this potential energy is going to be converted to kinetic energy, but also some of this potential energy is being used up to overcome the friction force over this distance. So the work done by friction is an energy that's being taken out of this. All right. So then, if, then what we have is this. We have the total energy at the top, which is only potential energy. So the initial potential energy at the top. equals the kinetic energy at the bottom. But then we also have to include the amount of work lost to this friction force. This is the work due to the friction force. All, right? all of this energy here has to be accounted for all of this energy at the bottom. It's like if I have $100, assuming that's what I have at the top, I have $100, and then I give $20 to someone else, which is the money I lost due to friction, then I have $80 left over. The total money at the top was $100. The total money that I lost due to friction or I gave to someone else and the total money that I still have, those two things together, the $20 that I lost due to friction and the $80 I still have, 20 plus 80 equals 100. So these two magnitudes together must add up to be the total magnitude that I started with. So technically, this equation can also be plus work lost due to friction. We can add that quantity to this equation if there is friction force. That work, that energy loss due to friction is at the on the right side of the equation, which is the total amount uh, at the end equals the total amount at the beginning of this equation. So then we have this. So potential energy at the top is still mgh at the top equals one half mv uh, squared at the bottom plus the friction force times the distance. And remember. All these are magnitudes only because we've already accounted for positive and negative directions. These are all magnitudes. This is the total that you have at the top, and this is the total at the bottom, and what you've lost due to friction. Okay? So notice we cannot cancel out mass because this quantity does not have mass in it. So we have to keep the mass in that equation. So we're going to write all this out. It's going to become a rather long equation. This mass, again, is 0 0.500 kilograms. We're going to put 0 0.500 kilograms times 9.80 meters per second squared. I'm going to kind of write small because I have to fit it all in here. Times the height, that height, vertical height is 0 0.40 meters. Again, it, this height is the vertical height from the rest, from the zero potential energy level. This is going to be equal to 1 half 0 0.500 kilograms times the velocity at the bottom squared plus the friction force 
And let's say we'll say, let's say this friction force, we measured it, and that friction force is going to be 1.20 newtons that's acting on that crate. Now, I would just say that's the magnitude. We measured it in some way, and we're given that information. So this is going to be 1.20 newtons. This is the distance which the friction force acts. This, di this friction force acts through the entire length of that incline, which is 1.30 meters, not 0.40 meters. This friction force acts through that entire distance, not just this distance. So we have to put one point times 1.30 meters in for that. Now, if we do this calculation, we calculate all this out. This is going to be 1.96 joules. This is going to be 1 half times 0 0.500 is 0 0.250 kilograms times velocity at the bottom squared. Plus 1.2 times 1.3 is 1.56 joules. Newton meters is a joule. We do this calculation. I'm going to subtract 1.56 from both sides, divide by 0.25, take the square root of that. You should do that calculation. And you should, to verify this answer, that the answer is going to be 1.26 meters per second. And it makes sense that this final velocity at the bottom of the path with friction should be less than the final velocity at the bottom of the path without friction. All right? So that's some basic information. That's the uh, energy relationships of an object going from the top of the incline to the bottom of the incline. Notice that seems a lot easier than doing forces and, and stuff, depending on what you're solving for. What I want you to do now, I think you can pause this video. And on LMS, there is a roller coaster video demo that I kind of talked through some of the energy changes in a roller coaster. Watch that video, then we're going to come back here and uh, uh, restart this video. Again, if you just pause it, you should be able to come back here and press play, and it'll pick up where we left off. But watch that roller coaster video. It's only a minute, a couple of minutes long, and come back here, we're gonna do some roller coaster problems. So you some basic information of how to analyze the motion of a roller coaster, okay? So go ahead and do that. All right, welcome back. Hope you uh, enjoy that roller coaster ride. Uh, we're going to now look how to solve problems involving roller coasters. So we're going to have a new piece of paper. And we're going to start with a, a, a diagram of a roller coaster, a very simple diagram. You have to draw this on white paper. And we're going to use this diagram to solve several problems, three, four, maybe even one, two, maybe four or five problems, and different ways to do this. So we're going to put a lot of information up here and solve this, several different things. So we're going to have a, this is a simplified diagram of a roller coaster. We have the top of the roller coaster here, and it goes down to a low point, and it comes back up to a little bit higher point, but higher than what it started with, okay? That's the path of a roller coaster. We have a, we'll have a cart here to show that there's a roller coaster there. We'll say that cart. And we'll say that the initial velocity of this roller coaster is real close to zero meters per second. One of the problems we're actually give this some velocity at the top because roller, the roller coaster isn't actually completely stopped at the top, but we're gonna simplify it and do it this way first. And we'll say the mass of this cart, whatever it is, We'll just say it's 200 kilograms, so that's the mass of the cart. Now, we're going to call the top of the path position A. The bottom of this hill is going to be position B. And the top of that hill is going to be position C. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, we're going to draw a horizontal dotted line represent the bottom of this roller coaster. All right? And this height from A, vertical height from A to B, is going to be... 25 meters. This vertical height from C to B is going to be 10.0 meters. Okay? And um, let's just go ahead and put this in here. This distance, linear distance, the distance along the track from A to B, that distance is going to be 45 meters. And the distance from B to C, this distance, the linear distance from B to C, we'll say is 30 meters. So you have all that information in there. Okay. Now we're going to start simple and get a little more complex. First of all, we're going to start analyzing this as if there's no friction. All right. So it's the simplest first. There's no friction right now. What we want to do is we want to determine what is the velocity of this roller coaster at point B when it goes from A to B down that roller coaster, down that hill, so to speak. Well, again, we use the law of conservation of energy, total energy at the top, total energy at position A, was equal total energy at position B. And again, this is some height above this bottom point of B, and we need to define our zero potential energy level. 
So we're going to say the bottom point is our zero potential energy level. Now there's going to be some problems where we define our zero potential energy level a little bit differently to show you how to make it easier to solve the problem. For right now, we're going to say this is our zero potential energy level. Okay, and we want to know the velocity to be at the bottom of that with no friction. So the only energy it has at the at point A is going to be potential energy. So we have potential energy at point A, and the energy it has at point B, because it's at, now at the bottom of the path where we define that as zero potential energy, the only energy it has at point B is going to be kinetic energy. Notice that's almost exactly the way we did the incline. As long as there's no friction, all this potential energy is going to be converted to kinetic energy. We put this equation in, all the uh, variables in for this equation, mgha, equals one-half mvb squared. Notice that's almost exactly the way we did the incline. If we look at this incline problem, incline problem, all the potential energy at the top equals all the kinetic energy at the bottom when there's no friction. In fact, it's also the way we did a free fall problem falling straight down. All potential energy at the start equals kinetic energy at the bottom. So just keep that, those in mind. It's a very consistent way of solving a problem. We use energy relationships. Now we're given the mass. We can put that in. But since there's mass on both of these equations, we can cancel them out. Put them in, cancel them out. It doesn't matter. You'll get the same answer. Again, this is magnitude only. So it'll be 9.80 meters per second squared times the height from the zero potential energy level, which is going to be 25 meters, equals one-half the velocity of B squared. If you do that calculation, again, don't forget to take the square root of this, you should get 22.1 meters per second for the velocity of B at the bottom of that path right there. Okay. Now, let's do, <coughs> sorry, let's do the velocity at point C. Hmm. How fast is that roller coaster moving at point C? Well, we've already gone from A to B, and it really doesn't matter where you start because anywhere along this path, the total energy has to be the same as the starting energy. All right? And since it's only starting with potential energy here, the total potential energy here has to be equal to the sum of the potential kinetic energy anywhere along this path. The total energy is the same no matter where you go along this path. And so Let's since we roll since we have the roller coaster down at point B, let's just start at point B for right now. So right now we're gonna say point B is a starting point. At the point B, the only energy it has is kinetic energy because it's moving. So we're gonna do this. The kinetic, kinetic energy at point B, and then we come up here to point C. At point C, we hope it's moving. We don't want it to stop, we don't want to be stationary in the middle of a roller coaster and not be able to go anywhere. We're hoping it's moving at C, so it has kinetic energy, but notice also it's some height above the zero potential energy level. So it has two energies. It has potential energy at point C, and it has kinetic energy at point C. We must include both of those. So now we want to write these equations. This is going to be 1 half mvb squared equals mgh, that's the height at C, plus 1 half mvc squared. So the velocity is going to have a point C. Notice each of these quantities has m in there, has mass in it, so we can cancel out. If you want to leave it in, you can leave it in. It'll all it'll work out either way. But since we have mass in each of these quantities, I'm going to go ahead and cancel it out, make it a little easier for the calculation. So then we have 1 half times the velocity at b, which that velocity at b is 22.1, this will be 22.1 meters per second all squared, equals 9.80 meters per second squared, times this height, at C, and that height is going to be 10 meters, it would be 10.0 meters, equals one half times the velocity, whoops, plus one half times the velocity at C squared. So this is the potential energy plus the kinetic energy equals all this kinetic energy at point B. We solve this calculation, again, I suggest you do the algebra so you know how to do this. What we'll end up getting is the velocity at C should be 17.1 meters per second. Again, I urge you to pause this video and make sure you do this calculation correctly. You should get 17.1 meters per second. And notice that's less than the velocity of B, which it should be because we go down from A, we go real fast, we're going the fastest at point B, then as we go up the roller coaster it slows down a little bit and we're still moving at point C to go along the rest of the path of the roller coaster. Now there's another way to do this problem. I'm going to come over here. This is, or we can do this problem another way. We can actually, again, we can start anywhere along this point of roller coaster we want to. We could have started at A and said, well, how fast are we moving at point C? Well, let's do that. And we're going to simplify this. We're going to define things a little bit differently. So we're going to start at point A. The only energy it has at point A is potential energy. 
So we have the potential energy at A. Then we want to go to point C. Well, what we're going to do, since we end up at point C, and C is lower than A, what we can do is we can define point Z, C as our zero potential energy level. We'll say this is zero joules of potential energy. I'm going to redefine our zero potential energy level at C. That way at point C, if that's our zero potential energy level, the only energy it has is kinetic energy at point C. But make sure you understand, if this is our zero potential energy level, we'll cross this way, then this is the potential energy A. This is the potential energy of A relative to our zero potential energy level. So we're going to write this. This is going to be MGHA going to be equal to 1 half MVC squared. Again, the masses cancel out. You can put them in if you want to, but I'm going to cancel them out. This HA, though, isn't 25 meters. This HA is relative to this zero potential energy level. So this difference from A to here is going to be 25 meters minus 10 meters. This height is 25.0 meters minus 10 meters, which is 15 meters. This is what we're going to put in for HA. So we have 9.80 meters per second squared times HA of 15.0 meters equals one half velocity of C squared. If we do that calculation, we're going to get 17.1 meters per second, the same that we got this way. Now, which way is the better way to do the problem? Neither. It doesn't matter whether you do or you start at B and go to C or whether you start at A and go to C. It just depends on what information you're given. If you're given both information of A and B, it doesn't matter which one you start. As long as you understand, if you define this as zero potential energy level, you just may, must take that height from that uh, zero potential energy level, which is going to be 15 meters. All right, so that's frictionless analysis. There are other things that we can do with it, but we're going we're gonna to add some friction to this. I don't have to move up and down here to get the diagram back in, but this is going to be friction. We're going to add friction to this roller coaster. And what we want to do is we're going to say that this friction force along the roller coaster, because it's not completely frictionless, any roller coaster that you have, and there is friction between the wheels and the, and the uh, path of the, uh, of the track itself. And so there's going to be friction from A to B and B to C. All right? And so let's take a look at that. We'll say that this friction force is going to be 216 newtons. And now with that friction force, what is the velocity of that roller coaster is going to be at point B. So now we have friction acting on this, and that friction force is acting over this distance of the track, 45 meters from A to B. Without friction, we said the velocity B is 22.1 meters per second. With friction, it's going to be less than that. Let's find out what that is. But we still do it the same way. Total energy you start with, total energy you start with, must be accounted for all the energy with friction and the kinetic energy you have at point B. So then, what type of energy does it have at point A? Only potential. Potential energy at A. Now we're going to move our zero potential energy level back to here. All right, so our zero potential energy level is now here. So the potential energy is based on this height relative to B. So it only has potential energy at A. It's not moving. Uh, maybe in a problem coming up, we might put some uh, motion in there. So it only has potential energy at A. At B, since that's our zero potential energy level, it has kinetic energy at B. But then we must also take into account the work due to the friction force. Okay? So let's put the numbers in, or the variables in. This is MGHA equals 1 half MV, this is the B squared, plus the friction force times the distance. Now remember, these are all magnitudes. Don't put any negative or positive signs in here, because all of this energy must equal all the energy that you start with. Notice we cannot cancel out mass because this quantity does not have mass in it. So we have to keep the mass in. So I'm going to write this equation. I'm going to kind of write it a little small so I can fit it all in. This mass is going to be 200 kilograms times G, 9.80 meters per second squared. And that height is going to be the height from our zero potential energy level, which is going to be 25 meters. Equals one half the mass, 200 kilograms times the velocity of B squared, that's what we're solving for, plus the friction force, which is 216 newtons, times the distance to which that friction force acts. That friction force is acting through the distance of the track, which is 45 meters from B to A. So I'm going to put 45 meters in here. All right. Again, I urge you to do this calculation. What we're going to end up getting, we're solving for this velocity B right here, 
this velocity of b is going to be equal to 19.8 meters per second. This is with friction. Notice without friction, it was 22.1 meters per second. So we lost some motion, some energy, due to the friction force. So it was not moving quite as fast at b with friction than it was without friction, as you should easily understand. Okay? Now, let's do this. Let's, um, let's figure out the velocity at point C with friction, so the friction force, is still going to be 216 newtons. All right? Now we can do this a couple of different ways, actually. But let's, um, let's do this. Let's start from uh, point A and go to point C. We could have started at point B. We would have done just fine, like we did here. We started at point B, went to C. But we also solved the same problem going from A to C. We can do it either way. But I'm going to start at A and go to C for this problem. All right? Again, you could go from B to C. You'll get the same answer. But we're going to do this as a demonstration. We're going to start at C. Uh, in fact, I'm going to come down here I'm going to, because I need the space. Velocity at C with a friction force of 216 newtons. New problem. All right? Velocity at C with friction force of 216 newtons. So if we start at point A, we're going to start at A, and we're going to end at C. Oops. End at point C. Okay? Start at A, end at point C. So at A, again, the only energy it has is potential energy. And we're starting at A and ending at C. We are going to use, uh, instead of using, we're going to go ahead and use the bottom of this as zero potential energy level. Let's see how it works. Now, we could have used this as zero potential energy level, but we're going to go ahead and use the bottom as zero potential energy level. Okay? You can do it either way. So then, the only energy it has at A is potential energy. So we have the potential energy of A is going to equal, now at point C, because we're using this, this is again is our zero joules of potential energy level. This, and we're not going to use this anymore, we're going to use this as our zero potential energy level. It does have some potential energy relative to this position. And so it has potential energy at C if we're using, if we're using this as our zero potential energy level. It's also moving at C, at least we hope it's moving at C. So it has kinetic energy at C, plus it loses some energy in the form of work. Okay? So you have all this potential energy is converted to potential energy at C, kinetic energy at C, and some of that energy is lost due to the friction force. Okay? Let's put the variables in. This is going to be MGHA equals MGHC. Again, this is the height above the relative position of uh, zero potential energy. Potential energy equals one half mvc squared plus the friction force times the distance through which that friction force acted. All right? We cannot cancel off the m because this quantity does not have m in it. So we're going to use all of these quantities, including the m's. So we put these values in. Again, this will be kind of a long equation. This will be 200 kilograms. Again, magnitudes only, 9.80 meters per second squared. And this height, again, we're using this as our zero potential energy level. So this height, HA is from our zero potential energy level, which is 25 meters. We're going to put 25 meters here. So this is all the energy that starts with, which must equal the sum of all these three different types of energy. This is equal to 200 kilograms times 9.80 meters per second squared. And this is the height of C above or relative uh, zero potential energy level. So this height is 10 meters. So we have to use 10 there. plus one half the mass, 200 kilograms, times the velocity of C squared that we're solving for, plus the friction force, which we said was 216 newtons. And that 216 newtons, since we're starting from A and going all the way to C, that entire distance, 45 meters, this entire distance, that total distance from A to C is 45 meters plus 30 meters which is 75.0 meters. That's the distance we have to use that the friction force acts. Because the friction force acts through all that track path. Whoops, all of this track path, which is 75 meters. So we put 75 meters in for here. All right. So I'm going to kind of do this uh, a little bit in steps. We calculate all this out, and I suggest you do this calculation. Make sure you do the calculation correctly. There's going to be 49,000 joules for that calculation. This calculation is going to be 19,000 600 joules, one half times 200 is 100, so this would be 100 kilograms, 
times the velocity of c squared, that's what we're solving for, plus 216 times 75 is going to be 16,200 joules. Again, you can pause this and do the calculation because we're solving for this vc right here. Now I'm going to take 49,000, I'm going to get rid of these values right here. So I'm going to take 49,000 minus 19,600 minus 16,200. And if I do that, I'm going to get 13,200 joules is equal to 100 kilograms times the velocity of c squared. I'm going to divide by 100. That's going to give me 132. That's going to be meters squared per second squared equals velocity of c squared. Then I take the square root of that, and I get 11.5 meters per second. This is the velocity of C with friction. Notice the velocity of C without friction was 17.1. And we did that two different ways. There are actually a couple different ways you can do this calculation. Also, I kind of did it the long way, but there are other ways you can do this. And we get 11.3. So that's a slower velocity with friction than it was without friction. And that's what we should get. Uh, that's a basic uh, um, uh, law of conservation of energy problems. We're going to stop there today. Uh, there's no quiz today, but there will be a quiz tomorrow over this type of information. Problem solving involving uh, inclines, which is this problem like this, and problems involving roller coasters, problems something like this. Okay, uh, That's it for today. Tomorrow will be your quiz. Have a good day.